I've had Dr. Will Bolsowitz on the show a few times and the Sonnenberg. So we, we have spoken about the microbiome, but if someone's kind of catching this episode and hasn't listened to those, I mean, I, I do suggest they go back and, and listen to those, but at a sort of high level here, how does food actually interact with the microbiome? I think that's an important point for us to, to kind of just go over. And why might people respond differently to different foods based on their microbiome composition? So at a high level, um, when you eat food, depending on the type of food, it, it may or may not reach your gut microbiome is one, one, one thing to, to realize. So cheap, highly, re- highly refined, ultra-processed food um, where or you're just having a sugary drink, for example, may uh, go straight into the small intestine and get the sugar gets absorbed into your bloodstream with very little interaction with your gut microbiome. We don't know that's absolutely true, but that's what we think. Um, other food that might be healthier that contains, uh, say, plants uh, with, with high in fiber will get further down into the gut, into the lower intestine, where that's where most of the microbes are. That's where they interact with it. And there will be several components of the food that will interact. And one of the key parts is the amount of fiber. Uh, fiber is basically there, so it, it, is, it will be protected until it reaches the lower part of the intestine. And that's where the microbes will uh, attack it and break it down into its constituent parts and extract all the nutrients and create these other great chemicals on the way. And they also extract from the plant something called polyphenols, which is the other important thing that we've only really recently realized that are like rocket fuel for your gut microbes. So we can't process polyphenols directly, but our microbes can. And by using the fiber and the polyphenols, our microbes are then sort of energized to produce all kinds of chemicals, vitamins, everything else to control the rest of our body, control our immune system, etc. So that's the essential way. Then also you've got, you know, they, they still, you can break down sugars. Uh, the, the, fat, the microbes break down fats for us. Uh, they're fat eating microbes, just as there are fiber eating microbes. And they break it down into these smaller components, these small fatty acids that get mm-hmm. used uh, and, and protein as well. So in a way, we have a whole niche of uh, little animals in there that are taking all the components, all the different foods, and the greater the variety of the food you're eating, the more uh, this colony of little microbial animals will be, and the more the greater diversity of the chemicals you produce. That's that's my vision of this, mm-hmm. um, and it, I think we're gaining more knowledge about how you know, each week about how important. Uh, the micro processes are the enzymes they produce are in breaking down that food and, and really doing it efficiently so that there's no waste and we're not hanging around lots of blobs of flat fat in our bloodstream or um, you know we're getting excess sugar uh, that's causing all kinds of stress to our body and there's not so much inflammation it's all dampened down so all this depends on our microbes really functioning really well all the time. Yeah, I don't hear often hear uh, many people talking about protein and fats and the interaction between those and 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 our gut bugs. And I I saw a paper the other day. I haven't dug into it in detail, but it was looking at omega three DHA and EPA. And I was surprised to see that they seem to find that that they uh, DHA and EPA some some of the fats at least made their way down to the large intestine and and had a prebiotic effect. Um, so it'd be kind of interesting to to watch that space of of research as it evolves the other half of my question tim was what about our microbiome may dictate the types of food that that we feel best on that that leave us feeling energized vital and that positively affect uh you know biomarkers of of disease yeah well it's a tricky question so in a way one is you know, cause or effect, you know, and it, I think it's, we've got to realize there's a two-way process between the microbes and, and our food and our brain. 
obviously, if you've got the right set of uh, microbes, then you're going to um, be able to, to get rid of foods, digest them much more easily. Uh, I think that's the... Um, so if you've got fat-busting microbes, then uh, actually you'll be able to deal with fat pretty well. But if you don't, they might leave you bloated and uh, having problems. Um, but of course, the more fat you eat, then you will start to gain uh, fat-busting microbes uh, in the same way that if you don't eat plants and then you, you know, you're lacking all of those uh, fiber-breaking down products. So I think there's a, there's a sense of uh, you, can, you can build up these microbes over time that then you get adjusted to it. But if you are really changing your diet in a big way, then um, you could be in for a shock for a while until your body is used to it. We do know you can acquire microbes as you go along. And, you know, I think you've talked before on, on podcast about the seaweed story and um, how, how people can gain microbes. You're not just fixed in the amount of microbes you have. You can, you know, just by eating lots of sushi, suddenly acquire uh, the ability to break down some of these uh, t tougher um, uh, plants, etc. So I think it's a, it's a two-way process. But uh, so some people may have trouble eating foods because they don't have the right microbes uh, that, that break them down. They then send different signals to the brain, which um, might say this is dif difficult for me. And we do know from animal work, not human work, that uh, microbes can send out signals um, to actually choose the foods for you. Mm -hmm. So, um, which sort of makes sense in an evolutionary way. If you think you've mm -hmm. got the microbes that are all struggling to survive, and you've got this little microbe only only likes uh, eating burgers. Um, it, it, if there's a way he can evolve a signal to send to your brain, to say, oh, you know, send me more burgers down, otherwise I'm going to mm -hmm. die, um, you, you would do it. And we do know that in tiny little insects, just by manipulating the microbes, they can send signals out to say, you know, eat more protein or eat more carbs. And uh, so we know in theory it's true, but I think it's, it's this... Uh, we definitely are a mix of our microbes. And because we're all unique, you know, all of us have a unique set of microbes, we are going to be getting different signals and we'll all, in a way, be able to digest food slightly differently mm -hmm. uh, because of that. So, again, it goes back to this idea of our uniqueness and the fact we, we you know, the standard diet isn't going to have the same effect on all of us. With regards to those signals, I've always wondered this. Do you think, you know, I know that you know that approximately half, 50% of the average person's calories today are coming from ultra-processed foods. Do you think the consumption of those foods could be changing the microbiome in a way that then it's this kind of positive cycle where the microbiome is sending signals for more of that, that food because there are certain bacteria in there that are thriving off that? I definitely do, yes. I mean, I think it's going to be quite hard to prove in humans and that's why we may have to rely on animal studies to do that. But mm. it, sort of make, it sort of makes sense, particularly you see people who are on junk food diets or, or animals on junk food diets, they have a very pro-inflammatory set of gut microbes. So these are microbes that like an inflammatory environment. Uh, you know, they thrive off it. Um, and that allows them a niche because the ones that don't like it are wiped out, basically. So mm. these guys have have the place to themselves. They like it a bit hotter, if you like, than everyone else. And so it's in their interest to keep it hot, uh, to keep the other guys away so they can dominate. And I think that's that's the way to look at it. So um, I think it's perfectly plausible that, yeah, our microbes are producing these signals uh, to our brain to uh, keep this whole uh, process going and, and that's why it may be you know difficult for some people to break this um, cycle or this junk food cycle that our microbes are contributing to it as well as you know other other bits in our brain you mentioned the 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 fact that our microbiome may see us have different uh, different foods that are optimal for us, that we, we do best on. And I'm interested in kind of how variable you think that is across, across humans. 
are, are we talking about variations of a of a theme of of eating that that is optimal for humans, or are we talking about one person who, due to their microbiome, literally will do best on a say carnivore or meat diet, and the next person does best on raw vegan? How much how much kind of personalization variation are we talking here? Oh, it's a great question. I'm not sure I. Uh, I have- <laughs> I can give you any more than a wild guess at that. Mm. Um, but, and it, it sort of depends what's your starting point, really, because I think, you know, we all start with zero microbes and we end up with a whole variety of different ones and how we've acquired them uh, might be important in what sequence we, we acquire them. Um, so there's no doubt that, you know, if you are an Inuit or, uh, you know, you're living in the extremes of a planet, uh, people tend to eat more fats and more proteins than they do plants. Then, then they and their whole and their genes have also adapted to be able to cope with extra fats. So, uh, I think there would be some idea that you'd expect the microbes to be very good at breaking down fats and requesting more fats, and perhaps not so good at lots of grains in those extreme bits of the planet. But I think definitely that. Some of this variety in our in our tastes could well be coming from our gut microbes. Uh, I'm sure that's true. Mm-hmm. Whether it's fixed or it's uh, something that we can modify, uh, I'm not so sure. You know, there seems to be relatively three compartments of our gut microbes. One is that some change sort of every day, some hardly ever change, and some you know will change over a few months if you change your diet. And I, I'm I'm not quite sure how much is absolutely fixed. I have a feeling that humans are actually more flexible than we think and that we, you know, we are these amazing, om- successful omnivores. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I wouldn't like to think that everybody is absolutely fixed forever mm-hmm. in, their, in their microbes and their tastes and whether they're you know, only going to eat meat or only going to eat plants. I like to think that we do have more flexibility, but it may take a long time to, to reach it. Mm-hmm. 